Hello everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's program. My name is Glenn Patterson. I'm with the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. Um, we're here this afternoon for a heritage talk. It's part of an ongoing series that we're doing here at uh, Quan. Um, anyhow, um, we have a great lineup of speakers uh, throughout uh, spring and early summer. So just about every week we have one or two speakers. So you can check out our program on our Facebook page. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. It's just uh, basically if there's anyone out there who's interested in the history and heritage of Quebec's English speaking communities, we're a nonprofit group. Uh, we support small museums, historical societies, as well as individual researchers, fans, aficionados, whatever. Um, and we have a lovely publication that comes with a membership. So if you're watching this, either on Facebook Live or on Zoom. Um, during this broadcast, if you'd like to tr have a trial membership for a year, we're offering a 30% discount. Um, so instead of $30, it'll be $20. Um, I wanna talk about um, today's speaker. We have Simon Jacobs. He's a past president of the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. He's also a former director of the Morin Center in Quebec City. And he's um, an expert in Quebec City's Jewish community. And that's what he's going to be talking uh, to us about today. So without further ado, I want to bring Simon on. Simon, uh, unmute yourself and, and let people know who you are. Are you sure you want me unmuted? Well, I suppose since I'm giving the talk, it's probably a good idea. Yes, hi, Glenn. Um, hello, everybody. So uh, yes, this is going to be a talk about uh, two particular people within the Jewish uh, community. So shall I start off by sharing the screen, Glenn, right? Yes. Okay, so just give me a second. This should work. And here we go. So can you see the screen? Is that fine, Glenn? Everyone it sure is. It? Yes, it sure oh, is. Excellent. Okay, then. So you ready for this? Here we go. Um, the actual, let me just tell you how this all came about, was in 2005, the city of Quebec was getting ready to celebrate the 400th anniversary in 2008, and they called out on communities and groups if they wanted to go and put a project together to, well, they, they were willing on anything in you know, history or artistic and so on. And uh, I came up with a bright idea of why don't we do a story on the history of the Jews of Quebec, because all other books I'd seen beforehand were all dealing with Montreal and hardly anything talking about Quebec. And so uh, we started off the project and I've got to say we had an amazing bunch of people with Pierre Antille, with uh, uh, Frédéric Potoc, uh, Arthur Aaron, uh, Denis Bourgeois. These were people who were on the board of directors and um, also contributors, incredible contribution. We put the exhibition on three years of work to put the exhibition on back in uh, 2008, which took place at the train station. And then after that, we'd collected so much information that uh, Pierre and I said, we've we got to produce something out of this, produce a book. And ultimately in 2015, after three years of working on the book, we came out with Les Juifs de Québec, 400 ans d'histoire, uh, which was published by the uh, Presse de l'Université de Québec. Um, and um, I think it should still be available. I think I have a, see, I have a copy right here. So it, it's actually quite a, it, it's not an insubstantial book. And I reckon I have enough for another volume like that. There is that much history. And so that's where we're coming into today. I was asked by Quan to give a, a, a talk and saying, can you come up with the interesting concept of one or two people? And so I've come up with the idea of speaking about uh, two people, Sigismund Moore and uh, Maurice Pollack. Uh, Sigismund Moore, I'm not sure if you've even heard of. Maurice Pollack is well known within Quebec because he ran a department store and Sigismund Moore was for electricity. So by the end of this, you're all going to be experts as well. Let's see how this goes. Sigismund Moore. Um, he was well known for having the most amazing mustache and uh, the sideburns. In fact, what I have pales in comparison. But wait, there's more. Okay, don't all laugh at once. Um, let's have a look at his origins. He, he was originally born in 1827 in Breslav in Prussia, uh, which is now uh, known as Wrocław in, um, in Poland. 
now. And just for your uh, edification, if I click here, you should see, okay, let me click here then. You should see actually a picture of what, uh, this is pre-First World War, evidently, uh, like pre quite a lot of wars. Um, uh, you can see Prussia is in green, uh, you know, Bavaria and so on is in yellow. So this is before Germany was um, unified. And we can see over here, uh, Braslav, which, uh, which is now, as I said, part of Poland. Um, he was born 1827, as I mentioned. He graduated in 1849, at the age of 22, um, as an electrical engineer. Uh, this is the same place, uh, actually the same town that Steinmetz, uh, who went on to really create the AC, um, AC motor and uh, all the physics behind it. Uh, he came from the same place and studied at the same university. He married Bloom Levy, uh, who is a uh, lady from New York. Uh, came from a New York family um, and um, had five daughters and two sons. By the way, he was actually between um, 1827 or he left 1849, he went to London. We know he's living in London. We're not sure exactly what date he came to Canada. He's apparently married in Canada. Uh, it could have been in New York, I'm not sure. But then he, it was, we know for sure he arrived in 1871. In 1871, um, don't know too much. The first time we actually hear of anything about Sigismund Moore was Mrs. Sigismund Moore, Madame Sigismund Moore, who was listed in the uh, Quebec directory uh, of the time um, as a um, seller of ladies' undergarments. Uh, so I will be doing a whole talk about ladies' undergarments later, but not today. Problems at the beginning. He had quite a few problems um, to start off with. Um, I think life wasn't so easy for him. Uh, let me just do something here. Will you excuse me a second? Technical problems. Aha, that's better. Um, wait a second. There is more. That's better. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so he was having problems at the beginning. In September, September 1875, he was under court orders to pay for $100 for products purchased the previous year to a Montreal wholesaler of pharmaceuticals. What he was doing with pharmaceuticals, I don't know, but obviously he was trying to find some sort of business. Um, then a little bit later, he was um, ordered to pay $412 to a Levy merchant by the name of Antoine Carrier in September of 1877. Uh, it seems that he kept on racking up bills. Um, by, he moved into a house in St. Jean Street on April of 1878. Um, and in December of 79, all of his furniture was confiscated for failure to pay for the rent of his living quarters on the, in St. Jean. Two months later, his attorneys argued that the premise, uh, the premises were insalubrious and had been so declared by the city inspector who, after examining the aforesaid house, condemned it as uninhabitable and ordered the defendant and his family to move out at once. The Moore family had, in fact, actually lived in the house for a year after having heard about that. So we know that things weren't so good. Uh, the rent was at that point $120 for the year. Pretty interesting. Uh, so we know things weren't uh, going so well for him. So let's see what happened. He, he really started coming to his own when um, he started uh, his own telegraph company, the City District and uh, uh, Telegraph Company of 1876. So this is also around the same time he's having problems. So I've just discovered that in fact, he probably was also trying to run a, um, a messenger service, a city and uh, district messenger service. And this probably would have been literally physically taking messages from one place to another. Um, he started the district telegraph company and was given uh, uh, awarded that he could have a seven month, a uh, seven year contract as long as he didn't disrupt the emergency uh, telegraph lines. Because don't forget, this is just before the telephone is starting to happen out. In fact, talking about the telephone, he demonstrated the uh, demonstration of the telephone in 1877. Uh, he's already starting to work. He's looking at what Bell's happening. There was a great big um, discussion between Bell and, or, or discussion, there was a competition between Bell 
and Edison. In fact, the Canadian, uh, the Canadian District Telegraph Company of Montreal got the rights from Bell, uh, from the Montreal Telegraph Company that used Thomas Alva Edison's telephone invention. And the Montreal Quebec line was carried out in that year of 1877 as well. Um, so there's big discussions. Uh, Moore dissolved his city district uh, telegraph company in 1878 and was then employed or was bought out by the Dominion Telegraph Company at Quebec. So he now becomes an employee. One of the things that happened, though, is, uh, and you'll see in the picture that we have, or the, the drawing that we can have on the right, is a picture of these incredible telegraph poles all over the place. Um, and you've got to understand quite often if there was competition or um, uh, the, the companies wouldn't share the telegraph poles, they actually put up their own telegraph pole. At one point, uh, we do know he was, uh, he was actually arrested for getting into an altercation with the owner of, um, who was it, the Daily Telegraph, yes, James Carroll, uh, because basically he stuck a pole outside the, literally outside the office window of James Carroll, who took umbrage, uh, and an ax, and proceeded to try and cut down the telephone pole, uh, upon which a kerfuffle broke out and uh, the arrest happened. Um, so life was difficult. Uh, in fact, we see from uh, from Felix Leclerc, he wrote uh, in a song uh, called Les Poteaux, Venice has its gondolas, Miami has its palm trees, France has its monuments, and for us, it's the telephone poles which is quite true. I've got this amazing, I've just got to show you this phone, uh, this uh, photograph. This is actually from Montreal. I didn't find one for Quebec, uh, but you can see these posts going up and the amount of lines going. But if you want to see for the ultimate picture, that is the one. This is actually taken in New York. Um, and all I can say is thank God for wireless nowadays. Let me just go back to here. I just want to go back a little bit. Um, yes, one of the things that happened is uh, when he set up the telephone, he uh, had to uh, try and get as many people as he could. He actually set up as a demonstration a telephone between Monsieur Lavigne's shop and the priest's room at the Quebec Seminary to give uh, to try and get more clients. Um, when he started off, he had 79 clients and ended up with 240 by the time he actually left the company in 1883. So let's just go along. Isn't that incredible? I just love that picture. Um, he was actually in complete competition with Cyril Duquet, who is actually um, uh, well known in the Quebec story uh, because he actually created the handset that you can see. You can see there's a, this is actually a reproduction of the telephone that Mr. Cyril Duquette uh, created. He was a clockmaker, a jeweler, an inventor, and became a politician as well. So, uh, yep, yeah, this is the precursor of the large, chunky cell phones that we see later on. Um, he didn't have the same type of moustache, so as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't work out um, as good as Sigismund Moore, that's for sure. In fact, what happened um, when Bell took over the job here or took over the um, uh, running of the telephone lines, uh, he seemed to be in contradiction because he t and um, Moore testified against Duquette that the telephones manufactured by him were installed at Quebec and leased on an annual basis for a price that varied according to distance, but on the lines of the Bell telephone. So um, Duquette did, thought he had total rights. Uh, ultimately, it went to court and um, we can see in the next slide, just a second, everything is being hidden by my by controls. Um, the, uh, the result of it though, after he lost, he had to give up his telephone. So it says here, gentlemen, I have uh, forwarded today by boat to your address, six call bells and six telephones formerly belonging to Cyril Duquette. Um, and then he goes into explaining where they were actually had. He had six clients. And so this created uh, a, a a lot of hostility between him and Duquette, which would carry on throughout his uh, career because Duquette went on to become a city councillor and sit, sat on many committees and tried to block Moore in many ways. Okay, uh, Moore actually uh, obtained permission to install a telephone cable between Quebec and Levy on the condition that he find 10 enterprises willing to subscribe for $100 a year, which is quite a lot of money at that time. If you think about it, he actually laid a cable 
under the St. Lawrence River to get to Levy. And he reached that objective by 1882 uh, in August, even though he started off in December of 81. So uh, pretty inventive. He found ways of increasing the, uh, um, the power of the telephone and had quite a few patents out himself. If you now look at the lovely picture, we can see a picture of this is Côte de la Fabrique, it hasn't changed that much. You've got City Hall is over here. And his, um, his place would have been at 32 Rue de la Fabrique. Um, in 80, let me just have a quick look. In 80, um, 83, he actually left the company to create his own uh, company, which founded actually the Quebec Levy Electric Light Company in 1881, though we don't really hear anything about it until 1884, just after he leaves uh, what was Bell um, and became the general director of this company he had formed. Now, the company was to it was there to produce this new electric light. Don't forget, dynamos had just been created a year or two before. Uh, we had the uh, Thomson uh, Moore, uh, uh, the Thomson engine rather, a dynamo. Uh, we had General Electric, uh, creating it. Uh, that was with Edison. Oops, I've forgotten. And um, we also had this competition going on between uh, um, uh, with the idea of what, what is better, direct current or AC current. Um, let's just have a look. What, so what happened is he set up his first company um, with a steam driven turbine. Um, or steam, uh, the, the dynamos, he had six dynamos, the Thompson dynamos that were actually housed. If you notice, this is at the, just inside the St. John Gate in Quebec City. And this is the artillery park today. And he set up his, his um, engines right in here in this, what used to be used for hauling cannons and cannonballs. Um, and he used it to light up the skating rink and a couple of lamps on St. John Street. Uh, much to the dismay of quite a few of the people that were living there because unfortunately it made an enormous amount of noise and a lot of <clears throat> black coal dust was coming out of the chimney just to be able to light it. So can you imagine this constant boom, 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 boom happening from six o'clock at night until 12 o'clock at night just so you can have your electricity. And in fact, a petition was signed around asking him to relocate which he did, in fact. But before I just go there, you can see the picture. This is actually from 1946, but you still get a pretty good idea. Same buildings, and you can see the big chimney there, probably left over from when he was there. So what happened is he suddenly had this great idea. He said, well, I don't want to be disturbing neighbors. Where can I get, where can I put it where there's power? And he said, how about the Montmorency Falls? So let's have a look. He moved there. Um, you can see actually this is a watercolor probably taken from before because the Morrissey Falls had already been used by the Patterson Hall um, um, sawmill, uh, one of the largest sawmills in North America, if not the world. And that was to help with also with all of the wood that was being used in the Quebec shipping industry because Quebec was the center for wood uh, constru uh, uh, for wooden boat construction. And a lot of the boats, in fact, were sent over to England and quite often they may be actually broken down uh, to actually recuperate the wood. There were actually these massive barges, we're talking about, um, <laughs> I forget exactly how long, that's another story, but they were actually designed just to go over to England to be broken up into wood. So let's have a look. <clears throat> In this picture, we can see a, uh, we have the Montmorency Falls uh, here, but rather the, the, the powerhouse, for the Patterson sawmill was not at the bottom of the falls, but in fact, the water was redirected along the cliff face and then down to two places where they had small dams and then down the cliff, there's one, uh, the, uh, uh, one house here and another house was here. Originally, this place was for running the uh, sawmill itself. And this was a little house that was used for making broomsticks and uh, buckets. Just to put this into condition, if any of you have been to Montmorency uh, uh, recently, you will notice, in fact, there's a lovely walkway from the house all the way to the dam. That is following literally the path that the uh, water went along in these large tubes. And I'll just show you here. You can see this is the, the dam is along uh, on this side. Uh, you can, and then 
there's no bridge there because the bridge had actually fallen down a few years before. And you can see a pipe that's taking along the water all the way along here, the bridge poles, this is taken uh, at low water. So um, fascinating to, to see that he was actually able to capture um, a pre-existing condition. So as I said, the Patterson uh, Hall sawmills were there to create wood, but as you probably all know, 1871 was when uh, there was a big crisis in Quebec. Uh, it was a terrible situation when the army left, but also ships started being made out of steel or iron. And as a result, the shipping industry collapsed in Quebec and also the wood industry collapsed in Quebec. And so the Patterson sawmill found itself with less and less wood to cut. And so that's why they were willing to let Sigismund Moore sign a seven year lease on his power on, on the um, on the house that was making these saw, uh, these buckets and brooms. Let's just have a quick look. This is a picture of the uh, Patterson sawmill. The waterfall is just further over on this side. You can see these were the large sheds with the uh, large um, uh, large blades for cutting the wood. And here, over in this end, this is the little house that was used for um, uh, creating the broomsticks and had a 21 inch um, turbine to run all the machinery that was used there. And you can see right down here is the, um, is the chute where the water went down at a large pipe. Interestingly enough, uh, that's where the uh, Le Voile des Dames or the, um, uh, the waterfall is coming down on the side. It's literally where that house was. There is nothing, there's hardly anything to see of that house. I've been on the area. If you look at the other, um, the other area where there's, uh, where his second um, hydro uh, production par, uh, power plant was, you can still see that the, the pipes are up there. It's a real shame that in fact, that uh, this is a CPEC run um, site now. They hardly mention anything about it, though I understand they're now giving guided tours talking about electricity, but there needs to be more done on this. So he installed his <clears throat> six dynamos. He literally took them out from, um, from the uh, Rue de Teuil and moved them literally into this area in the, this little house here. Uh, you can see the, the pipe coming down, delivering the water. And he was able to create uh, his, uh, um, his, I think they're producing 200 watts, kilowatts. Uh, DC power, because this is before they really came out with the AC at that point. Now, Mr. Moore was an incredible promoter. He decided, uh, because they needed to create money or they needed to create business. And so what they ended up doing on the 29th of uh, September um, until the 6th of October, he decided to create a spectacle. Oh, somebody's got their microphone on. So anyway, he decided to create a spectacle of lighting on the Dufferin Terrace. And uh, at the time it was unbelievable because don't forget in the cities, the only way people had lights was by using either gas or coal oil. Um, both of which tended to give a few explosions if you weren't very careful or be blown out if there was a high wind. And um, they didn't give off much light either. And so suddenly you have this uh, suggestion of electric light and everyone was, uh, was just hearing about electricity of Edison and the New York um, hydroelectric power and uh, Buffalo being lit, lit up uh, by, by light. And suddenly here in Quebec City, one year later, we see the same thing happening here. Uh, it was really a publicity stunt. It was from the 26th of uh, September to the 6th of October. And 20,000 people came out on the first night to listen to this, uh, to, to see the spectacle of, as it became dark, an electric bell goes off and suddenly all the lights come on. Well, the lights it took a while to come on because they're ca uh, carbon lights. They literally, you force and I'll show you this in a second, you, you force the current to jump between two carbon rods. And that's what creates this incredibly intense light. Um, here we go. 
And so we find in the newspaper on 29th of uh, 1885, 29th September, an exhibition of this light show, The Power at Montmorency Falls, will be given on the Dufferin Terrace on Tuesday, the 29th at eight o'clock sharp, weather permitting, as well as on all other nights during the week. By the kind permission of the officers, the band of the 8th and 9th regiments will be present. So double whammy, let's do something. Let's just have a look. Let's have a look. Then we see the next day. Now, this is really interesting. Sirs, it can hardly be necessary to inform the public that the arrangements on the terrace are only a temporary character. The unknown nature of the post uh, make, make this evidence because literally they, they used uh, wooden posts to put this uh, to put the lights on. Nor do I, when, uh, when lighting the terrace by electricity, intend to have more than from six to 10 lights instead of 30. The object of all these lights is an experiment to make proof of the possibility of keeping up a continuous and sufficient current by power generated at the Montmorency Falls is thoroughly explained in the very ably written and interesting notice published in your issue of yesterday under the heading electric light. The public therefore need not be alarmed at this probable call, uh, cost of lighting upon uh, uh, on this place of resort. The thing is, 30 lights, which were arc lights, were in fact incredibly bright, uh, leading to some of the people who were living in the area actually staying, complaining that it was too bright. It was in fact, uh, somebody from Levy was saying, wow, we've never seen Quebec City at night. And suddenly all this light comes on. There, there were more and more articles, uh, illumination by electric light. Um, people loved it, the, the terrace illumination at light, uh, the, the fact that um, he even changed the glass at the last, on the last day. Uh, so it's clear glass and instead of frosted and boy, I mean, you just can't look at these things. Uh, and, and my favorite little bit of, of course was uh, this that came up in the news as well. A number of electric light preparers whilst at work yesterday had an exciting chase after a large fine large fox, which was eventually captured by a man named Noel. I thought you'd like to know about that one. There is also uh, the, in the Daily Telegraph that happened, uh, we can start seeing people are waking up to the idea, wow, electric light is so much better than uh, what we have in homes and churches. And so this is a, uh, somebody asking for a church uh, uh, said, this may have 40 sort of gas lights happening in the church. It could just be replaced by one electric light. Uh, along comes, um, we're, we're really happy to see electric lights. Uh, seven new lamps are now in production on St. John Street. So we're starting to see it's really being taken up. Uh, and he's, he's saying, you should go and see what's happening. Uh, it, the gas company is um, still has some time to run its contract. In fact, what happened, the gas company was unbelievably scared. They could see that this competition was incredible and they managed, and probably with the help of Duquette who was on the city council to sign a seven year contract um, at the same time as this was literally on November the 1st, uh, they signed a seven year contract with the city to provide gas for lighting. Um, and the story goes that they asked for, uh, that they started passing a rumor around saying that you can turn the lights on, but you can't turn them off. And so literally uh, more went or uh, had to do an exhibition during this period and say, watch, we can turn the lights off and turn them off one by one as well. So uh, also other newspapers talking about fluid coming into the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, these lights are run by fluid because they didn't understand what hydroelectricity was. I hope you had a chance to read that. Other things that were happening, they're talking about the cost of electric light. It's reported that it's gonna, they're going to charge $12,000. In fact, it cost $11,000 to set up this um, exhibition. And it was quite an amazing thing. Let me just put it in um, perspective. When... Uh, Edison ran his uh, hydroelectric power. He had a five kilometer or five mile line. What happened with uh, Moore, he actually managed to run a 34 kilometer line to and from. So he improved the actual transmission of the lines uh, at the time. Uh, it was an incredible feat. It's like only 14 kilometers to here to the Montmorency Falls, but you have to go there and back.
We can also then see, so the, 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 obviously the company is trying to get in there and they're saying they're asking $12,000 and it's coming out of our taxes. And then we see a little bit later on, the general uh, de Quebec is saying, actually the cost of the corporation for lighting the streets already is $9,800 a year in round figures of which $7,000 are paid for gas and $2,800 for coal gas lamps. So is it, such, is it so more expensive when the lighting is so much better? I saying, uh, what is an arc light? Arc light, uh, 75 hours at this point, 75 hours before the carbon had to be replaced. And that was an incredible job because you actually had literally these sticks of carbon and you can see them here on the side. Here's a carbon rod and here's a, car, a, a the lower carbon rod um, that were continuously, as soon as you have the electricity going through, they created a spark. If they're too far, nothing happens. If you want to stop it, you have to have the uh, carbon actually touching. So you start it by touching and then you slowly pull them apart. I didn't get into the whole deal of this, but they actually created, the, the Thomson company created a whole ballast system that would automatically pull them apart or push them together. Um, at the parliament buildings, he actually managed to get a contract at the parliament buildings to set up uh, the lamps and he was, he was charging the money 50 cents a day for a lamp to light up. And uh, we can see the double lamp that was what was used at the parliament building. And on the streets, we had the single lamp. Uh, I just found this, <laughs> found this photograph, cleaning the lamps. Um, if you think about it, 75 hours is not such a long time. So you had to replace the carbon rods. And also they gave off a lot of soot. Uh, unfortunately, one of the problems that happens with carbon is also they could be a little bit dangerous. They made an incredibly annoying noise. One of the things that Tesla was known for was for creating a, um, a, um, a device where he patented a device that changed the frequency so it would be beyond the sound of, uh, for humans to hear. And uh, here we can see somebody in the precarious position of cleaning and changing the uh, carbon for the carbon lights. So, oh, wait a second, let me just go back a sec. Uh, oh dear, okay then. So in 1892, we have the uh, Quebec and Levy Electric Light Company becomes the Montmorency Electric Power. So already we can see we're trying to change the, the name, uh, the, the whole idea of um, uh, changing the structure of the organization. Obviously this is done by Sigismund Moore. Uh, and unfortunately on Friday the 15th of December, 93, uh, he dies. What happened is three weeks beforehand, he had um, that there'd been a, an incredibly like an ice storm in Quebec City and it knocked down the power lines. And he, as the general manager and feeling really responsible for this situation, he actually went out there in this freezing cold weather uh, and helped direct and help put up the redirect power lines. And unfortunately, because of that, he caught pneumonia or, or, or a flu, got sick for three weeks and finally died. Um, his family ended up moving to New York, which is where he is buried now. Um, and, uh, but the new plant itself that he'd been working on, it opened up in 1894 with three 600 kilowatt two-phase alternating current generators, uh, which were the first of their kind actually in North America. Unfortunately, they actually switched to, um, uh, to three phase later on. Uh, I just wanted to show you this picture. So this, this he'd already set the whole thing up. He saw the alternating current was the next, uh, was the next thing. It was uh, far more powerful and cheaper to run. And this is a picture taken 1910 of the power plant already. You can see it's one, two, three, four, five dynamos in that picture. And these are producing AC current for the city of Quebec. Uh, one of the things also that it did, and this is also contentious in Quebec, but uh, it was creating the electricity that the tramway could use, which was opened in 1897 for electric tramway. 1898, we can see a merger of the Montmorency uh, uh, electric power with the Quebec District Railway, which operates the tram networks, and uh, Montmorency Charlevoix Railway under the same name, and became the Quebec Railway Light and Power. Uh, one of the things that happened, if you want to see how his, uh, uh, so, so this all happened after he died. Uh, by the way, just to let you know, his granddaughter, Esther Lyons, actually married Nathan Phillips, who became the first Jewish mayor of, of Toronto. So there's a little aside for you.
let me see if I can make this work. Okay. And here we go. This is the uh, last thing I want to say about poor Sigismund Moore. Uh, this was uh, in the newspapers after he died. And it just, it's astonishing to see what it said. I maybe just want to take out one or two things that, he, uh, that was written here. We regret to say that one of Quebec's best known and most valuable citizens passed away from earth in the person of Mr. Sig Mr. S. Moore, the active and respected manager of the Quebec and Levy Electric Light Company. Now, he goes on to say, it is no exaggeration to say that Quebec has sustained a severe blow by the death of Mr. Moore. Few men did more to advance its interest in every way. Later on, altogether, it may be truly said that Quebec loses in him a man whose like it will hardly see again, and the better part of whose well-fitted life was unceasingly and successfully devoted to the promotion of some of its best interests. It is therefore no idle remark to state that the whole community deeply regrets his death. Incredible, huh? I mean, the only thing left of Mr. Sigismund Moore is a plaque that you can see on the house, which is where he lived opposite Artillery Park or very close to it. In fact, on St. Ursule Street. And it says, here lived Sigismund Moore. For, for somebody that was the most important, well-known and respected, he's one of the most ignored uh, and unknown people that should be brought back to, or his memory should be brought back to life for sure. So uh, this is an ongoing situation. Oh, how did he get there? Wait a second. Just one last thing. <clears throat> As it says at the very end of it, the two sons fill important positions in the United States. One of them is here now, Mr. Eugene Moore, being a first class engineer and at the head of the telephone and electric light service of Brooklyn, New York. So we can see that what he created followed through in the family. So an incredible story for Quebec. I don't know if I've even done it justice. It's in the book that we have printed. And um, there's more to come yet. I think uh, there's still a lot more research going to be done on him. And now I'm going to have a glass of water. Do, do, do. Um, Glenn, just a second. Yes. Should we open up for questions on Sigismund Moore? Um, why don't we Why don't we wait till you finish with Maurice Paul? Because I know a lot of people um, remember his store and everything. I think there'll be some people that have a few things they want to ask you about that. Is that okay? That's fine with me. Okay. Okay, here we go. Round two. Morris Pollack, not known for his beard and mustache. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. He's a department store owner, entrepreneur and philanthropist. He was well known in Quebec City uh, for the Pollack uh, store, um, was a real pillar of the Jewish community here. And uh, let's, let's explore a little bit about his life then. Yep, let's just go here to explore about his life. So his early years, he was born in January 28th in 1885 in Konela, which is a small Ukrainian shtetl. A shtetl is a small Jewish village. If you think of Fiddler on the Roof, that's a shtetl. About 30 kilometers north of Uman. Um, and you can see here is Ukraine. And you got Kiev, so it's between Odessa and Kiev. Uman is right here at the crossing words. And uh, if you've never heard of Uman, you may have heard of Rabbi Nachman, who was the founder of the Breslov Hasidic movement. Um, and that's in fact, uh, um, he, uh, Rabbi Nachman died in uh, Uman. So we know that this is a large Jewish, uh, a large Jewish population there. In fact, part of the reason is also a Jewish population because it was uh, this was part of the Pale of Settlement. Um, let me just show you a little picture of the Pale of Settlement. Here we go. Um, there was a push from the Russian Empire to uh, really reduce the place where the Jews could live. They were kicking them out of Moscow. They were kicking them out of all sorts of St. Petersburg and so on, and reducing and reducing the area that they could live in. Again, think of Fiddler on the Roof, and you'll have a pretty good idea of this is where people were being told to leave their villages and move and so on. And this is why we also see a, a large push um, out of um, uh, of Jews leaving Russia as fast as possible and Eastern Europe to be able to go to the new world, which was accepting immigrants at that point. So again, you can see in this picture, 
and I can't get to it. Here we go. There, there is uh, the area that he was born in. Uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, Romania is here. You've got the Russian Empire. This is all part of the Russian Empire. And uh, you've got Poland, Germany up here. He arrived in 1902. And um, the only thing that he was able to do at first, as is many immigrants coming from Eastern Europe, was to start working as a peddler. Literally, either put a pack on his back or get a horse and cart and travel around the villages. Now, you've got to understand also in Quebec, uh, the rural life, not many people had a chance to, to leave or to travel far. And so having somebody or an itinerant uh, salesperson coming to your town or your village was actually very useful because you didn't have access to as many things. Maybe there wasn't a general store. So um, this is actually a picture of Mr. Charon. Um, he had the route in Sherbrooke, but they, they literally um, shared uh, or uh, set up different routes. They wouldn't be um, uh, comp having competition between them. And Mr. Pollack started off in 1902, going door to door, uh, being put up by people, um, welcomed. And it was actually literally, uh, <clears throat> through this hard work that he managed to save up because he came penniless. He had nothing. So he's helped by the Jewish community. And uh, by, by 1906, he was able to open up a store in uh, on St. Joseph Street, 43 and a half St. Joseph Street, pretty close to the train station. Now, train station was really important because it was also a hub, especially for people that lived in the regions. Quite often, the men would be working in the uh, in the woods during the winter come by train at springtime and they would stay in Quebec City for maybe a day or two and literally buy all of their stock that they needed for the year and then go back to their villages, do the planting for the winter time, for the summer harvest and then go back into the woods and so it would carry on. And they'd arrive in Quebec City with a wad of cash, go all the way down St. Joseph Street and then come back up again and buying everything that they needed for their wives and their children and so on, drier goods, clothing and so on. So Mr. Pollack started off at 43 and a quarter uh, in St. Joseph Street near St. Dominique. Um, when he arrived also, he didn't speak French or English. He only spoke Yiddish because that was his maternal language. And um, he literally forced himself to learn how to speak French and English. I'm not very sure if he was able to read very well, but he definitely spoke it. Um, he met uh, uh, Rivka Tarantor, who uh, came here in 1907 with her family, came st settled in, uh, in Montreal uh, and also in Quebec City. And uh, they got married in Montreal in August of 1909. So the idea of, I think, setting up, maybe he met her in 1907, uh, he started his shop in 1906, so he really wanted to prove that he was he was somebody who was able to provide for his wife, and that really was the spur to uh, get married to her. Just a second. 1911, things were going quite quite well, and as a result, he moved further on down uh, Saint Joseph Street, and he bought number 85 Saint Joseph, which was close to the Rue du Pont. As I mentioned, St. Joseph Street was really important being near the train station because that's where all the people came in from the country. But St. Joseph Street itself was a street that um, had many shops, uh, especially had three large department shops. That's La Liberté, Syndica and Paquet. And it was the main shopping area for Quebec for, from the 1880s up until the 1950s. It was the place to be, not an upper town, which was rather crowded, but this was near the train station, near the tramway, which went right past. And so Pollack was eyeing these other people. We'll see a little bit about that later. So 80, uh, in, in uh, 1914, his wife uh, began running the women's and children's department. And they had their, um, the department for the women and children were up on the top of floor. He was really uh, avant-garde or he was really trying to um, work promoting the uh, the, the newest ideas of commercial enterprise, uh, especially at this time of economic growth, especially after the uh, uh, after the First World War, we're seeing the 1920s, we're seeing a boom situation, and he really wanted to be there offering the best. His, his mentality, uh, in comparison with many others, was 
buy the best materials possible in bulk and offer it at the cheapest price. And he was well known, especially also for having the one cent days, uh, maybe once a year, he would literally say, buy one article, buy the second article for only one cent. And there would be lineups all the way outside of his uh, building just for that. Uh, around this time, 50 other, by, by 1915, 20, 25, we're seeing 50 other Jewish merchants from Eastern Europe, also in the Lower Town. Um, they, generally, there were smaller, uh, uh, smaller enterprises. I remember speaking with, I think it was the Laxes, and they, literally, they were selling secondhand clothing and finally got enough money to go and buy brand new clothing and so on. So it was really scraping by. Not everyone uh, had the same sort of vision that Mr. Pollack did. And he put his time into it as well. Uh, back in, I think it was in the late twenties, there was a fire at 75. Oh, wait a second, before I go there, here's this one picture. We can see already he starts expanding by buying buildings either adjacent or close to him. This one was at 95 St. Joseph Street. And you can see he's already, uh, he's offering hair salon, uh, coiffure, massage, shampoo, and you can see all the shoe displays. So he's really, he, but he's mainly, he's not dealing in, in dry goods. He's not trying to sell everything. It's mainly the schmutter business, clothing for men, shoes, women, and children. Um, so let's just have a look. So uh, yeah, 70, in, in the late 20s, the building at number 75 St. Joseph Street actually caught fire and burnt down, which gave him the most incredible opportunity. Whereas we're, we're talking at the, uh, just at the beginning of the Great Depression, he literally gutted the building, gutted his buildings and rebuilt to create a brand new department store because he wanted to play with the big boys. And let's just go and see who the big boys were. As I mentioned, we have La Liberté, 1880s when they started opening and you can see this grand building the, the first of the of the large um department stores uh it's selling furs and selling clothing but also had other other goods that were being sold and uh, alongside that as i mentioned you had the syndica which is right at the um, corner of saint joseph and i think it's uh uh of course i forgot the no, do, do um de la Reine, that's the one that goes up to Saint, um, uh, oh well, whatever. I'll get, show you on a map some other time. Um, Syndica, and then you also have Paquette, and you can see Paquette is, are these buildings here. So these were the venerable um, large department stores that had happened. And Pollack, as I mentioned, starts, and we're gonna see that in a minute. Pollack starts his, uh, his uh, opens his store in 31, and it creates, even more competition with the others. So what happens, Syndica in 1946 create brand new modern building. And we see Paquette also changing things in 1950. They create their, uh, a, a new building to house things. La Liberté stayed the same. Thing which was interesting as well is the, the buildings previously, uh, very, very small built, small rooms, um, a lot of staff sort of, hovering around in each room and uh, Pollack in 1931 comes up with a new idea. Now to, in 31 when I, I mentioned he opens his store up in November the 28th and he starts off by advertising in because he knows who he wants to get. He, his, his clientele are the French Canadians. It's clear that uh, and he set up he, he was really good at making connections with suppliers uh, and talking also with the um, uh, with the with, with the French Canadians and so on, he said, "Listen, I come from the same place you do. You work hard. You're a worker. I came from a very um, a poor place. I work hard too, and let's share." And that was his his mentality. Uh, the list of generous and this it got me. I was looking at the uh, a copy of the paper. This came out on November 28th. List of our generous donators. This is for the Catholic Action Catholique. And there, lo and behold, Morris Pollack is listed as one of his donators. And why? Well, very good reason. He was advertising in their newspaper as well. And in fact, this is the advertisement for the first, uh, for, for his opening of the new store. 
adver uh, appears on November 28th, 31. And take note of this because it's going to play a very large part in what's going on. Uh, you can see the large, uh, the large windows have been changed. And he said, 30 years in the retail trade in Quebec City has allowed us to build and to open this new store. 30 years of studying your needs showed us what Quebec wanted. And then he goes on to say a little bit later, we'll see it. He says, 1931 is a year of new conditions in the lives of all of us. A depression that we hoped would disappear sooner is still being felt and many people are forced to comply with the new demands of life. This is a year when people have to practice economy in their spending. Many of us have less money to spend and we all need to take the right steps to get value for our money. And that was literally what he was doing. And in fact, you can see here at the bottom, le magasin de vêtements pour tu à un seul prix et au comptant, uh, comptant. <laughs> basically for cash. <laughs> and established in Quebec, uh, giving new comforts. I mean, he was really trying to be avant-garde. Interestingly enough, what do we see? Wow, what a difference from what was happening down the road where you have these small buildings. Suddenly you have, this massive space and aisles, uh, all departments are, uh, are kept, people can walk around, they have space, a new concept. And as he mentions, this is just like uh, it's a, 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 uh, a shop that is, uh, carries the practical methods of, uh, of modern commerce in Quebec. Uh, it's, it's as large as the prosperous uh, shops that you find in New York and we've, adopted their, uh, their system or their style of, uh, of business. One price only, because he was saying that it seems that if he's saying that there was quite often, maybe there was a price, if depending on who you knew, they could change the price and whatever. And he's saying, no, one price for all. What you see is what you pay and you don't have to haggle. And I'm gonna make sure it's the lowest price that's possible that I can make a bit of profit and you can profit from it too. And he said also, I don't want people to go and uh, overspend, which is contrary to what we're seeing over day, uh, today, isn't it? Let's have a look as well. Second floor, we can see what's happening. It's a uh, department for, the, uh, for men and children as opposed to the first floor. It's a uh, toilet um, for women, lingerie for children, lingerie and for children, and um, uh, things for, for, the children, uh, for the boys and girls. I mean, if you think about it, he's now set it up where the first floor is for the women. Who were his principal clients? Probably the women. Don't get them to go upstairs, but they didn't have stairs because he had modern elevators at that period too. Interest, interesting what's happening here. Um, he had gave a personal message. Um, have a quick look at that. I'm just going to keep on going to the next one now, actually. And here we get into the uh, situation where we see Eshte Shenu. Remember, I told you to look at that little picture up on the top where it had this. Well, this is the actual photograph that you can see of Pollack's store. And lo and behold, you can see a Star of David with a large P in between. Uh, this was taken during Carnival. So obviously this was taken a bit later on, uh, although Carnival had existed, the actual Carnival that we know um, happened in the 1950s, I believe. Um, but he kept, the same, uh, uh, the same grill above the door. And this caused massive problems. Already we're seeing, seeing the beginning of anti-Semitism, which had started in the 20s. Uh, Ashte Shenou wasn't a, um, a unified uh, position. Uh, Ashte Shenou in this case was, don't buy from the Jews stay amongst the French Canadians. And I'm gonna read you a little bit um, at the opening of the new store in 20, in, on, just before the opening in Le Miroir, which was uh, Adrien Arcan, who is well-known fascist and uh, um, uh, publisher of the Miroir. He published on a full page um, with the following text, an appeal to French Canadians. This is the holiday season. Make the resolution not to buy from the Jews, but always from the French Canadians. Our race needs all its strength, especially financial strength. Uh, and later on, 1832, 
let me just get to this one, 1832. So this is a few months, uh, three months after the store has opened. Um, we, we, in fact, what happened is, Ashtay Shenu, after this was published, um, out comes the, uh, um, apparently, all the parishes around Quebec during the Sunday sermon, they were told, don't buy from the Jews, boycott the shop. And it caused tremendous problems for, um, for uh, Pollack as well, because people weren't sure if they should go. I remember hearing a, a story about this priest that came in from the Beauce or from, from the um, North Shore. And he came to, uh, he was found in, in Pollack. So he was buying clothes or for, for the boys in, in the village. And somebody saw him and said, Monsieur Curé, you can't be in there. And he said, why not? He goes, well, because we've been told not to go buy from them. In fact, we can see where uh, we see here and, and later on in March uh, of 32, Maurice, uh, we see um, our client again, Prince Maurice Pollack of Quebec City is desperately trying to get French Canadian customers back to his shop. He announces, stirs, struggles, he's raising hell. And it is because Quebecers who have returned in large crowds to French Canadian stores in the capital have realized that they can have as good and even better quality uh, at as good a price as among the Jews. So he's, I mean, uh, the anti-Semitism that was going on at this period was really not good. And there's also another reason it's, uh, uh, he keeps on going. There's also another reason. It is because the Jew Pollack placed above his front door, the symbols of Jewry and Freemasonry, symbols which he insolently displays as if he were in a conquered place. And this insult to our race and his beliefs, he did just at the entrance of one of the most venerable churches in Quebec, which was the church of Saint Roch, uh, which adds to the cynicism of the Jew. Oh my goodness. By the way, just to let you know, uh, fascists or the Nazis were totally against the Freemasons. Well, uh, at that period, the Freem to this day, Freemasons are accepting of anybody of any faith. And I think this was, uh, um, was a, 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 were very much persecuted, especially by the Nazis as well. And uh, Catholics weren't allowed to join Freemasonry. It doesn't mean that Mr. Pollack was a Freemason, but he was a Jew. Um, the Mirror, uh, again, in a, a, the same edition, comes out with L'Action Catholique claims that money, even Jewish money, has no smell. So since Pollack pays us to invite you, go to Pollack in droves and all the French Canadian merchants have to die. At Catholic action, we appreciate principles, but we prefer the value of money, even the Jewish currency. So this is obviously he's talking against um, uh, L'Action Catholique for accepting Pollack's money. Thus, every Saturday, L'Action Catholique continues to announce the Jew, uh, Pollack, ha who had the audacity to publicly insult Catholics and French Canadians, putting the insignia of Freemasonry jury over the door of his store. I heard another story from Charles Pollack, who said, apparently his dad said, uh, w when they mentioned, well, or the bishop mentioned to him, you know, why do you have, get rid of the symbol above your door? And he looks up and he goes, I didn't know there was a, a star of David, but now you mention it, there is, and to heck with it. I'm going to keep it. And as you can see, he did. But it gave to uh, pretty tough times as well. Let me just go on to the next one. If you think that wasn't anti-Semitic, the, the article, I don't know if you can read that, but the article... Actually, I don't even know if I want to read it. It was so against him. Ultimately, Pollack becomes the, um, the sacrificial ghost as far as Le Patriot is concerned. They really hone in because he is the leader of the Jewish community. He's the one that's changing, uh, also uh, creating competition for the other merchants that are around. And he calls it the sly beast of Quebec. And, I'm not gonna read that because it just actually makes me a little bit sick, um, but it's full of um, typical anti-Semitic, uh, really uh, nasty stuff happening in there. Catholic action. Well, L'Action Catholique uh, says uh, on December the 30th of 1933, they didn't go against it but they try to take this kind of middle position and they come out with this and see if you can follow me on this. So obviously this is a translation because it was written in French. Anti-Semitism is no more lovable 
than pro-Semitism. If one leads to hatred, the other leads directly to national decay. So if you're pro-Jewish, it's going to lead to national decay. Attacking a Jew because he is Jewish is the last of the stupidities, but, well, the least stupid, but there is a twin stupidity to the latter. It is that not defending yourself under the pretext that by doing so one attacks a Jew. Are you following this? We should do no injustice, we should not do injustice to Jews any more than to others, but we always have the duty to defend what belongs to us. Between being an idiot and a precursor, uh, um, and sorry, between being an idiot and a persecutor, there is room for common sense. This common sense, for example, means that we refuse to let ourselves be driven out of our homes. So in a way, it's kind of wiggling around the idea, and don't forget that we have the Ash de Chenou happening. Um, ultimately, uh, this did come to some sort of agreement uh, later on because they were able to, uh, um, I think uh, the, the boycott lasted nine months and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. But there was another reason actually that the, the Axion Catholic was also getting a little bit uh, um, testy and that's because of the synagogue. Let's have a look. This is the, the synagogue, um, this was done in the 1940s. Uh, I think this was around 44 or 44 when the first part of the synagogue was created and it was definitely um, a push to create a new synagogue on uh, up in Montcalm which was terrible as far as the Catholics were concerned because Montcalm was like sacred territory. Um, let me just go back a little bit about the, the, the uh, synagogue. The synagogue originally uh, used by the people around the late 1900s up until literally 1950, there was a synagogue on St. Marguerite Street, just off from St. Joseph, not far from the train station. And uh, that synagogue um, had a balcony around the top. So the men were at the bottom, the women were around the top, a typical uh, sort of Eastern uh, European type um, setting, separate men and women from each other. And um, the men, as I said, 50 merchants in the area, and they would actually go and um, they would say their prayers in the morning. Uh, uh, unfortunately, they would have to uh, be open on Saturday. They were required to be open on Saturday, uh, which was a Shabbos, the, um, uh, the Jewish Sabbath, and they were required to be closed on the Sunday. Um, which they mainly followed. I don't think Pollack had any problem. In fact, it was his wife Rivka who actually pushed that all Jewish shops would be allowed to be closed on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur, or at least on the high holidays. Um, so she, she was the one of the, the force behind that. But meanwhile, in 1932, um, we see a, prop, a plot of land being bought, um, financed by Pollack to set a new synagogue up in the upper town because we can now see Pollock has opened up his shop and he's really sort of, sort of moving up in society, literally because upper town. Uh, we see something, uh, there, there is opposition against this the, in the city hall and there are petitions uh, signed by the people. How can we, uh, that they were really worried that the Jewish population would come in and would try and um, um, push all the good Catholics out. It was also opposite a house that was being used for retired priests and what an affront that you should have a synagogue, they should look over at a synagogue. Uh, the Action Catholic wrote in, in December of 32, for this matter of synagogue is only one incident in the whole drama in which our national and religious future is played out, the stages of which are marked by successive defeats. Ultimately, it went to court uh, and the Jews were allowed to uh, actually buy, um, build their synagogue um, and built it, they did. This is actually pictures of the first stage before they were able, this is just basically the basement, uh, which actually was uh, firebombed the day before it was inaugurated. Um, luckily, they managed to put the fire out and hold the, the ceremony. It was a wedding ceremony for Pollack's daughter um, that took place uh, the following day. Uh, let's just have a look and see, just for goodness sake, this is what they ended up building on top of it. It became, it's now actually the Periscope Theater. And you can see the inside of the uh, synagogue is 
uh, it was quite beautiful, could house over three or could seat over 300 people. It was quite modern as opposed to having the women, men and women completely separated. It became what was known as modern orthodox. So men and women were separated in the sense that they were sitting not necessarily side by side, but the women were maybe on one aisle and the, uh, the men in the middle or on another aisle. So it was uh, well, yeah, the women on one side, men on the other side. So uh, it was possible. Uh, so the community itself was changing. The, um, okay, so let's just go and have a look. So let's go, let's keep on going with his life. And we can see here, something had happened in, in the 19, uh, 30s and 40s, they decided to get rid of um, what was Chari, where there was a little street with houses on it, and they knocked it down to make this thoroughway, which is now as known as Chari Boulevard. And we're looking from Chari Boulevard, looking across at the new Pollock building. We can see here, this was another section that was added on. Um, let me get into that in a second. Let me just tell you about Pollock himself. He was basically a workaholic. From what I understand, he would work at like, get into work at 6, 6.30 in the morning. He would actually have the newspapers laid out and read to him so he could hear what's, what was going on. And he would work quite often until late, late, late night, maybe 11, 12 at night. So his wife hardly saw him at all. Um, I spoke with Sam Firstman, who actually worked for him in the 1930s. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, I used to work for, for, for Maurice Pollack. And he said, um, I remember him. He would he had his office on the third floor of the building. And you could hear him when he came down the stairs. Everyone would scatter because uh, he had these heavy footfalls coming down the stairs. And uh, he said, one time I, I was uh, there was no one in the shop because it was uh, early in the morning. And I was sitting around just standing around waiting for a client to show up. And he uh, Pollack comes up to me and says, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I'm waiting for a client. And he says, nope, that's not the way it works. He literally took a, a pile of sweaters that had been st stacked up, threw them on the floor. And he said, you fold them now, because I want, there should never be a time when it's, it seems as though you have nothing to do. If a client comes in, they will see you folding and they will see you being active. And I think uh, it just shows the uh, the ideas that uh, were going on uh, in, in his uh, head right there. Glenn, can I speak to you for a second? Yes. Uh, I know I'm going on a bit, but I'm noticing my battery on my telephone is blinking like crazy. Can you give me a one minute um, uh, time just to change the battery? Sure, that sounds, that sounds good. Okay. Um, okay. And if anyone um, has any questions, I noticed uh, one came in there from, from Brian Rock. If you wanna, um, we'll have, Simon, maybe you could wrap up in about a couple minutes. I'll see what I can do. Is it going on too long? Yeah, maybe we should try wrapping up. But yeah, if people, maybe you want to think about some questions. You can either put them in the uh, chat box or once we get into the Q&A session, um, you're welcome to turn on your camera, uh, wave. There is a raise hand feature. If you know where it is in Zoom, it's um, it's uh, there's a button that says reactions and you can go in there and there's a, another button that says raise hand. You can use that if you want or you can just do it the old fashioned way like this um so yeah as as you wish um also want to remind everyone we do have a, a promotional discount going on if you're interested in joining kuan even just to try it for a year see if you like our um organization and the magazine we put out um we put out four magazines a year um and we do have this new book um this new anthology which i showed a picture of at the beginning i'm just gonna Actually, I won't put that up, but we have this new two volume anthology. Um, it's really, it comes in like a hard sleeve and it's beautifully bound. And um, it has like, a, basically it's a compendium of, uh, I guess the organization's favorite articles over the last 20 years. I know Simon has a copy and it's, it's $45 and um, it's 25 to ship um, unless you can pick it up in person in Lennoxville. Hold on. Wait, look, there are two that. of them. So I'm, I've got to keep on going, but it's, it's actually a fabulous, fabulous magazine. Oh, I don't know if I can show you lots of pictures and it's, great text. It's a real resource because actually I think like a sort of a comprehensive book about sort of the history and diversity of Quebec's English speaking communities. 
I know a, a book that came out, an edited volume that came out in like 1980 or something. But since then, um, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's been anything quite this sort of comprehensive. Um, so anyways, it's a, it's a real precious resource. Actually, Louisa Blair brought out a book called The Anglos of Quebec. Which Quebec City simple. or the whole province? Oh, Quebec, I think it was more Quebec City, though. Yeah, I know that one. But yeah, the, the whole province I'm speaking, yeah. All right. You're, so, you're... shall I keep on going? I have a yeah, can couple you, more you, minutes. To yeah, do. wrap it up in a few minutes and we'll take questions. I'll, I will do that. I'm, I'm really trying to keep on, on the. Let's just have a quick look. Screen share. Am I still screen sharing? You are, yes. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay, um, I'll try and be quick. Um, so I talked about Sam Firstman, uh, folding clothes, walking down. Yeah, the store employed 125 people, which I think was the largest amount of people in the store at that point. He also decided to branch out. Um, he had three real estate companies and at the beginning of the war, he and Nathan Gardner, uh, who was a clothing manufacturer with a, fact, with a house on Uru Argo, went into business together uh, to produce army uh, uniforms. Um, though, it sounds like, hey, profiteering or whatever, but quite the opposite. Uh, it actually took him a lot of work and he was hoping that his three sons would be able to help him, but his three sons were enlisted. Uh, they'd already studied in university and then enlisted in the army and all served in the armed forces. So he had to go through with it himself. He had to hire 1200 uh, skilled workers. And then he also had to uh, try and get specialized machinery um, to uh, and import it from from uh, America, which was difficult enough as it was, to create the uniforms. Um, Charles, his son, wrote um, or said, Dad took back control of the store when I left in 1943, and he worked 16 to 18 hours a day to run the store and the factories. The point that I'm making is not that he was successful. I admire the guts that he took to undertake a task which, which he was unfamiliar and which could possibly result in killing both him and the business. It didn't in the end, but because of actually having to create so many uniforms and all these people that were hired, uh, as you can see in the picture here, this, this, uh, this building was added onto a store to actually create um, the, the production of the clothing. Um, late, which later on goes to become the brand new Pollack store. So right after the war, <coughs> early 1950s, we can see the Pollack store, which incorporates also this um, uh, this brand new uh, the buildings that have been created for creating uh, military clothes. It was a five story building designed by um, architects uh, Milton Eliasoff and uh, Saul Berkowitz. Now, Eliasoff actually went on to uh, design the um, synagogue here in Quebec. Very modern, large scale show windows, Stein and this was incredible. He put Steinberg's, which in itself, Steinberg, you've heard of Steinberg's uh, grocery shop. That was a revolution. The idea of having a large scale grocery shop, before it was just little, little grocery shops. And suddenly you have this large scale, which was Steinberg's. And he knew Steinberg and brought his shop into the basement of, of Pollack's. Absolutely avant-garde um, at the time. Um, multifunctional building had also office space for rent and um, ultimately uh, because of the second world war when people started coming back we start seeing also uh, unfortunately the decline of St. Joseph Street because uh, people didn't have car uh, people now had cars we start seeing the economy exploding and uh, it was difficult to get around actually in in old Quebec uh, there was nowhere to put your car so how could people go shopping and so he actually created one of the first multi-story car parks um, apparently uh, it was reported as a miserable place because it was always cold and damp, but nevertheless, it was on the other side of Charest and it still exists today with a circular ramp that goes up. I think it was the first of its kind in North America, at least in Canada. Do, 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 um, yep, you can see uh, this is a picture, uh, the real picture of the Pollack store. It still exists, but it's no longer uh, Pollack. Uh, it's the um, Cartier, I think it's called. Um, here we see uh, one of the things that people know about Pollax uh, still is the uh, is the house on at the corner of Grand Allée, uh, very close to Cartier Street. 
uh, upon which there is a plaque which says, here lived Morris Pollack and founder of the, uh, of the Pollack company. Um, he also went on to create a foundation, but uh, this was a picture taken in 1944 on June the 11th at the time of his daughter's wedding. Actually, it's quite sad. Um, here we can see a picture. There is his daughter, Florence. There's um, Sam Pedvis, the bride's parents, and we can see Rivka and um, uh, Morris Pollack. Notice the distance between them. Well, what ended up happening, literally the day after she got married, he moved out of the house and moved into the Chateau Frontenac. Literally a few doors down from Duplessis, who's also living there. Don't forget, Chateau Frontenac at those points or that period, <clears throat> people didn't just stay for a day or two. They would actually live in places like the Chateau Frontenac. So um, Interesting, uh, sad story, but from that point, he and Rivka were separated and never got back together again. Um, his kids, uh, you have, he had three, uh, four kids, sorry. You have Dr. Sam Pollack became an obstetrician, gynecologist. Uh, Charles Pollack became a business executive and helped run the business here, but also went on to go into the United States. Um, he kind of fell out with his father in 1947, probably because of the split between him and his mother. Uh, his, sorry, between uh, his mother and his father. Uh, Izzy Pollack was a, and here is Izzy, was a lawyer um, and also a merchant. He also helped run the business partly. And um, he actually, people don't know this, but he was actually the head of communications for Expo 67. Uh, he was the one that got the whole thing off the ground and marketing of that. And finally, uh, Dr. Pedvis, who married their daughter Florence, uh, was an obstetrician, was a uh, pediatrician and a pediatric allergist at Montreal Jewish General Hospital. I met them, lovely people. Um, let's have a quick look very close to the end. Um, one of the things that he did was uh, he was very philanthropic. Uh, at the, uh, in 1955, he created a, um, a foundation and he basically said, I told myself that I did not want to wait until after my death due to an action that has many merits. And it is mainly because of this, that I did not want to evade the opportunity to do good in my own lifetime. Um, even before he started the, um, uh, his foundation, he, he already given $25,000 to um, University Laval for the creation of a, uh, the pavilion Maurice Pollack at University Laval. <clears throat> and he gave that in 1948. We, we already see he's already organizing that in 1948 to give money to them. And according to his son, he was literally taking all the profits that he made from the, uh, from the manufacture of uniforms for the Second World War, went into the foundation to uh, do good deeds. And those deeds were very many. Uh, in 56, he received an honorary doctorate. Uh, in commercial sciences from the rector of Laval University. So we can see that the, suddenly things have been turned upside down in a funny sort of way uh, from the 1930s where he was vilified or where he was um, put down by the Catholic Church. We now see it's turned around and he's supporting the, uh, he's being supported. Um, whoops, 1955, he sets up a foundation, as I mentioned. He gives money to Jeffrey Hale. A lot of the money was also supposed to go to the OSQ, the Quebec Symphony Orchestra. He loved that also, um, he gave money to the OSM. You may have heard of Pollack Hall at McGill University, named after him. Uh, he expanded the law, the law school building at McGill and also um, uh, he gave uh, the Pollack Hall at the Quebec High School. Uh, the foundation has continued to this day. He's given money to many hospitals uh, in, in Montreal and also in Israel and so on. So he died in 1968 um, uh, on, in December the 16th, uh, age of 77. So, so I'm trying to get see what that says there. Anyway, so there you go. I tried to rush it off to the end. So I hope you've enjoyed it. It's the end of the presentation and now it's time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing this. Thank you so much, Simon. That was wonderful. Um, what a great, what a great overview. Um, I'm sure we have lots of questions. Some people have typed and I thought I'd just abuse my privilege here and maybe ask the first question. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us, especially with Sigismund Moore, 
what was the um the Jewish community that he maybe moved into when he arrived in Quebec City? I've heard the Jewish community, at least in Montreal, described as a kind of third solitude. Would you talk just a little bit about the Jewish community in Quebec City, maybe especially in Sigismund's more uh, his when he arrived and. Um, I know, for example, the Montreal Jewish community initially was more of a Portuguese, Spanish, Jew, Sephardic, I guess you'd say. And then it seemed like both of them were Ashkenazi Jews. Um, were they, did they integrate into an existing Jewish community in Quebec City when each of them arrived? Okay. <laughs> I could leave that for another talk, quite honestly. Um, I'll see if I can be brief. <clears throat> First Jews came in, came in with the, uh, with the British Army. 1879, 59, sorry. Um, mainly we're seeing Jewish merchants, uh, Hart, uh, Jacobs, there was Samuel Jacobs and so on, who are coming in also Eastern Europe, uh, not necessarily Sephardi, but then we see also um, um, Abraham Joseph, who was actually from Bavaria, but saw himself as being um, Sephardi. By the way, at this point, Sephardi, uh, if people don't know, Sephardi means coming, uh, literally the Jews that were pushed out of Spain, as opposed to Ashkenazi, which were Jews who were coming from Eastern Europe. Um, and the Sephardi, a lot of them went to North Africa and um, also Amsterdam, but then uh, the, the Eastern Europeans were there. So uh, what happened is we have Joseph who identified himself as Sephardi, um, and they would kind of see themselves as better than the Ashkenazi. Um, so it started off with a small Jewish community. I think the, the first synagogue uh, was in 1852, um, or around then, uh, uh, stories. Uh, ultimately we're seeing sort of English German influence up until the great British, uh, the great influ um, addition of Jews coming in from Eastern Europe. So it was never a large community, uh, maybe a hundred or so Jews who were here. As I said, they had their, fir their, their first rabbi was here. In 1894, I think it was, Rabbi Eliasoff was hired. Uh, just to show you the divisions that were happening there, it was kind of funny. There was an advert which was put out in a newspaper um, in, in the state saying, we're looking for a rabbi here in Quebec. Uh, has to be able to be a, a, a shachet, a, a means a ritual slaughterer, be able to give circumcisions and so on. Uh, but no Litvaks need apply. Litvaks are people from Lithuania. It just shows you there was racism in a sense with inside that. And uh, there was one uh, particular uh, rabbi who wrote back, Rabbi Eliasov, who wrote back and said, um, only a Litvak could do all the things that you're actually asking for. And actually got the job and stayed there for 30 years uh, here in Quebec City. Um, Am I answering the question? I tell you, it's, it's, it's a tough one to answer because... Yeah, I think, I think I was wondering about this idea of a third solitude. Would you say that description, I, I've heard it used for the Montreal Jewish community. Do you think it applied in Quebec City as well? Well, it was, it, to begin with, you see, as I said, we have the English, sort of the English community, uh, the Jews that were here, their, their synagogue was um, on uh, Rue des Jardins. And literally, I mean, they had the, there was a private cemetery, which was a Jewish cemetery, and literally they gave the key to the head of the, uh, the Eastern European and said, here, this is now yours, because it was literally like a, a night and day split between the two. It wasn't like they kept um, the, 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 the more English community died out. And then you see the, the Jewish community being sort of this Eastern European, I think at its heyday, maybe 750 people, um, up to a thousand people that were living in and around Quebec City. Um, and then we see it dying down in the 1960s, 1970s. Originally, when you look at that, you can say, hey, it's because there was uh, um, you know, separation and the nationalist movement. But I, I spoke with a lot of families uh, when I was doing the research and they were saying, oh no, we love Quebec and we didn't find it was very anti-Semitic when we were growing up. Uh, the reason is because our kids, there's mainly the language aspect, the kids went to English school, uh, they went to English university, they would meet their partner maybe once they were outside of Quebec and then they would settle down wherever it was. Now the parents are getting to the age, if you think about it, they start here in the 1920s, they're ready to retire in the 1960s and 70s and they want to be with the grandchildren. So right. they left. 
I think Brian Rock, I, I see you there, and you had a, a written, originally typed a question. Do you, do you want to just ask Simon? Hi, Brian. Well, hi, Simon. Fascinating presentation. Uh, in what year was the largest uh, population of, of Jewish people in the Quebec City region, sort of in numbers and percentage, if you know that? I'm going to have to get my trusty book out. Do I have it in here? I think it was 1950s. Um, how about that? Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. I, ha I have your book, so I'll look it up. It's no problem. Page 99, if you want to know. And uh, yeah, 1951, 1961 is really the peak of when people were there. Um, as far as Quebec was concerned, uh, percentage of the population was like a 0.25% of the population. Is there still a synagogue functioning in Quebec City? Barely. And what would the population be in 2021? There is another good question. I know that actually there are some members of the community who are listening right now. Um, <clears throat> That's a very good question again, because uh, it comes down to a question of what is, the, who, who is Jewish? Because originally being Jewish was you have a Jewish wife, a Jewish husband, um, uh, they have Jewish kids and so on. And suddenly you find mixed marriages happening and uh, what is, con ultimately for as far as we're concerned, everyone is welcome. Um, so we have quite a few people actually come to the synagogue who aren't even Jewish, who uh, they're not necessarily members, but they're, they're associating themselves with the Jewish community. Uh, that's why it, it's a very difficult question to reply to. How many Jews, maybe 100, 150 people of Jewish origin here or Jew, uh, who see themselves as uh, culturally Jewish, but not necessarily religious? Thanks so much. Pleasure. All right. Great we have you again. Yeah, it's lovely seeing you too, Brian. We have another question in the comments here from Apishek. He's a new member. Um, he said, thank you for the inspiring talk. Is uh, Sigismund more connected to the development and spread of electricity in Montreal? Um, he actually, not quite. I wouldn't, although there may have been some connections because he was also working with the Royal uh, Canadian um, Electrical Company, which is where he, he actually, they, they had the monopoly in a way of uh, the, the, the power system or, or the power dynamos, and they were the ones that sold it to Sigismund Moore. So I don't think he necessarily had it on Mon uh, to Montreal. They had their own system, but obviously he was working in, in concert with them because he was always on the, on the cusp of, of the newest releases, and I'm sure they exchanged a lot of information between them. All right, so that's the questions I see in the comments. Now, if anyone here on Zoom has any questions, um, turn on your camera, turn on your microphone, and uh, let us know what's on your mind. I don't know, I saw Anthony uh, Cote uh, turn on his camera. I'm not sure if he has a question or not. No, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to say it was really uh, fascinating as well to, to hear all of this history because, uh, you know, you don't think of, I hate to say it, but Quebec, I never really saw it as being that diverse in terms of the, uh, the the people that are there. I'm learning more and more about the, you know, the British and the Irish and everything, but you don't often think of the Jewish influence or, uh, you know, presence in Quebec City. So it's, it was fascinating to hear. Well, that's, that's why I did the actual exhibition also, because it's just forgotten. Like Sigismund Moore, you see what was written in the newspaper. This is the most important person and so on. Totally forgotten why and that's another thing that we have to ask ourselves i let you answer it great uh, thank you anthony that's lovely feedback uh, thanks anthony catherine dallaire uh, says simon tu es le meilleur you all know that <laughs> and um, she's the best too <laughs> and um jane jensen says she remembers uh, shopping at pollux with with her aunt so as well i think there's been a lot of memories of uh, pollux store and also just what a beautiful building in that kind of I don't know my architectural styles, but the, the, it reminds me of like the Snowden Theater of that era, you know, and just um, stunning, really, especially by today's standards. I just love that stuff. I see Sandra nodding. Sandra, what do you have to say? Um, the style is Art Deco. 
which Montreal has tons of, and most of them are still surviving, but Quebec City is very little. Um, what is the situation with where Pollock's store was, is? is uh, what's there now, Simon? The, the store is still there, but I think it's called the Cartier, um, and uh, you wouldn't know that Pollock's ever existed there. Mm -hmm. It's just um, that there's, there's work that needs to be done. I, I would love actually to do a, another project at some point, I don't have time for it, would be actually to uh, put signposts of the history with photographs, not just of the Jewish history, but certainly the Jewish history, um, all the way down St. Uh, Saint, Saint, uh, Joseph Street. It would be a great little thing to go. Sandra, you have something else? Yeah, something to say. I'm surprised Brian hasn't said this yet as well. Um, it's like the exclusion again of certain elements of the history of Quebec, um, which aren't maybe not they're totally they're not totally erased, but they're certainly not emphasized. And that's a whole non-francophone population. Um, going back and back and all the different communities as well. There's very little acknowledgement in the public way. I totally agree. I think um, we, we see this in the new history books. I, uh, I've been involved with Brian as well and you, Sandra, in, in talking about the problem with um, uh, how history is taught and, and its narrowness, its, its non-inclusiveness of other things. Uh, there's so much contribution that has been made and it's always presented in a them and us. And we, we saw that in, the, in, in some of the excerpts I was saying, you know, us, the French Canadian nation, uh, you, the Jew. I mean, come on, we all live here. We all contribute to the same place. And that is so stuck in the mentality and we can see where it comes from. Mm -hmm. yeah, Simon, I'd like to correct you uh, how history is not taught. And that is the problem. Yes, okay. Point taken. Mm -hmm. I saw Heather turn her mic on. Uh, Heather, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here. Actually, I've been ah. here a long time. Simon, it's been fascinating. So I, I missed a little bit at the beginning, but it's it's been a, a really excellent talk. When I, I just reminded me when I was a child, we grew up next to the Sir, da Sir Adam Beck Hydro power station in the Niagara region and we often heard about the the greatness of Sir Adam Beck and I, I would it made me wonder if people really knew who Mr. Moore was and the contributions that he gave if if school children in Quebec City know that history. Well the worst part about it is it CPAC I mean the, 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 the it's a provincial park and there's nothing there mm -hmm. and the worst part oh would you give me a second can I just can I just get something hold on Simon, he's, he's, got, he's got loads of props. Yeah. Oh boy, yeah, I forgot to bring this. Uh, here we go. As I run around, check this out. Can you see what oh. these are? Looks like a big these. fungus. Well, this. <laughs> These are insulating coils. This is so that the lines, it's made out of, uh, thank you very much. This, this is designed for, um, uh, for the cables, uh, for electrical, electrical cables, they're insulated, it's ceramic. And same thing with this, the, the, this would have sat on a pole and then the line would have run above it. Guess where I got these from? They're on site. I forgot to, I, I didn't find the photographs that I'd taken. These things are on site literally at the CPAC. And if you if you uh, take, the, there's still the vestiges of the Serpentine Road, and then you can get up to, I've never seen this before, the, you actually still have the downshoot on the second uh, power station. Just growing amongst the weeds, you can, it, it's it's phenomenal and it's not being used and it's not being promoted. I mean, it's, it, this is part of Quebec history. It's not because it's done by Sigismund Moore, but this is part of the history, you know, that they're, they're trying to create a new tram line here in Quebec. And this is totally related to it. They could profit from this so much. I want to just say, uh, we had a nice comment from uh, Marie Cote. She said, I agree about the unknown more. She said she learned a lot about him thanks to your book and now, love te now loves teaching his story and talking about him on her tours, so. That's right, I know Marie. Hi, Marie. 
All right, do we have any other questions? Let me, oh yeah, let me take the spot. Let me just take the spotlight off, off you. Sorry, Simon. Spotlight's on you now. I now gotta just change my view so I can see everyone in case anyone's waving there. I think we're okay. Um, Heather, do you, go ahead. Uh, I, I, got a, I got a request, hold on a second, gallery view. Can people turn on their microphones, those that are left? Because I'd love to see you. Or your cameras, I think is what you yeah, mean. Yeah, cameras, right? cameras. Oh, lovely. I haven't seen you guys for, I, I know nearly everybody there. It's brilliant. Hey, Ed. Oh, my brother's there. Hey, David. Where's my sister? She hasn't come on yet. John Adler. I can just see the top of your dome there. Uh, I can tell you your sister was here earlier though, Simon. Oh, she's there. Oh, there he is. Excellent. Go, Julia, Julia, hi. Oh, this is brilliant. This is like, a, for me, this is, this is so exciting. But, uh, uh, Edna, I can't see you. <laughs> Sandra, it's lovely seeing you. Mark Gallup, I don't think we've met. Have you met Mark? No, another time. There's my sister, Susan. Oh, brilliant. I'm having such a great time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, and um, I know it's a beautiful day outside, so I suggest we all go outside and, and um, have fun with it too. Now, uh, Heather, do you want to try? Now, Heather's my co-host. She was having some connection difficulties early. Do you? Would you dare do the outro? Uh, yes, let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the exit. All right. All right, Simon. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I, I mean, I heard about 80% of it, so I know the rest was all good too. <laughs> well, <laughs> Glenn, no worry, Glenn, watch the recording. You. Thank you, Glenn, for uh, you know taking care of everything in master control. I really appreciate that. Uh, to all the folks out there, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have our next one on Tuesday, uh, March 23rd at seven o'clock, right here on Facebook Live. It's with Keith Henderson and it's called Not As Crazy As You Think, the Canada's Fenian Scare and Thomas Darcy McGee. So more Irish to come and uh, Fenian. So it should be a lot of fun. Again, thank you so much, everybody. It's been great to see you and uh, tune in next time for Heritage Talks Online. Have a great spring afternoon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.